Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I'm so glad that you're here. In this week's episode, I have notes for you. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about coming back from a mental health sabbatical and how to ensure that we do it properly without relapsing. We will also talk about the relationship between eating disorders and control. Then we will dig into the differences between ADHD, autism, and complex PTSD, specifically in females and also how those in the medical and mental health field can deal with triggering situations or patients. We will also discuss why we can struggle so much with self-compassion and why some of us prefer to switch languages when talking about our struggles. Okay, let's get into those questions. And question number one says, Hi Katie, do you have any advice for people getting back into the workforce after a mental health sabbatical? I lost my job as a medical technician late last year due to alcoholism and compassion fatigue. I drank away a few months and then went to rehab where I got dual diagnosis treatment. And if you don't know what dual diagnosis means, it honestly just means like we have two diagnoses. And it's, it's usually used, dual, the term dual diagnosis is used primarily when we have um, alcoholism or an addiction plus something else, meaning I could have alcohol dependence and also depression, for example. Okay. <clears throat> So um, where I got a dual diagnosis treatment and did a lot of great work on my anxiety and depression as well. Wonderful. I am now three months sober, congratulations, and beginning to interview for new positions, but I'm struggling to explain the empty block of time on my resume. Taking time off work to focus on mental health, burnout, etc. seemed to be so encouraged the last couple of years, yet it's still something employers don't like to hear at face value. How can I navigate this? It feels like now that I'm healthy and ready to work, I only created new barriers for myself. Okay, that's a great question. There's also a comment on here about, you know, how can we go back without deteriorating again? And when it comes to communicating with any kind of employer about our mental health sabbatical, I find it best to say, I had a medical issue that I had to take care of and that forced me out of work for a little bit, but I'm fine now, fully recovered and feeling great. That's how we talk about it because it's none of their business. And if we're going to say it and we find it's stigmatized and not well received, meaning we don't end up getting those positions, then it's not going to, it doesn't behoove us to share that, right? I'm not saying we have to lie. And I wish this wasn't how the world was, but I, that's how I always have coached my patients is to say, I had a medical issue because it really is a medical issue. We're not really lying. We're just not sharing everything because it's our private information and they actually have no right to ask us about anything more than that and if they ask questions you can be like you know it's personal i'd just rather not talk about it it was really painful i don't want to relive it we can say any number of things like that but i find just saying something to the fact of i had a medical condition or a medical emergency that i had to take care of and i did and i'm feeling great that's all that's how i would say it they can't ask we don't have to share and that is plenty of information for them to understand what's happening and that you're back and you're ready to work, okay? Now, the other question says, as an add-on, how can we prevent deteriorating again once we go back? I'm going back for my final year of medical school after a year off and I've done a lot of work and I'm in a better place with my anorexia and depression, but I still have struggles. I'm scared I'll just revert back to drowning myself in endless studying, not looking after myself and isolating even more. Could you give any advice on how to keep up the work and improvements that I've made during the time off? This is a great question. And yes, I have tons of advice. First of all, it, it it's like the most helpful for us to look back on what created the issue in the first place. So like you said, like studying, endless studying, not looking after yourself. Now, I know you said medical school, so I don't know how flexible this is, but usually when I'm talking to my patients who are going to go back into university or something like that, I always tell them to not take the same amount of credits that they did the time before. I know the perfectionist in you or the type A or the super driven person is like, but I need to, what would I do if I don't? You'd have time for yourself so you don't burn out, become overwhelmed and deteriorate. And we need that time. That time can be filled with things like coping skills, uh, journaling, talking to our therapist, uh, going to group therapy, taking care of ourselves for lack of a better term. So that's my first point is to ensure that we don't max ourselves out by doing more than we really should. And the fact that we had a fall off before proves to us that we maybe don't know 
what that right amount is. And so I want you to trust me when I tell you that the, the amount you were doing before is not what we need to do now. We need to do less. And less doesn't mean that you're not as productive or you're not doing everything you could. You're, you're doing the best you can. And if we do more, it's only going to make us feel worse. And we don't want to go back there, right? So that's number one. Check into what you did before. Let's not do that. Second is ensure that you still have support, whether that means like a weekly group, having friends that we see re- you know, regularly, making sure we've set up with our therapist, dietitian, whatever that might be. Keep those appointments and keep that schedule very regular. Then third is considering the tools and techniques that you learned in treatment that were so incredibly helpful. What are those? Let's write those down. Let's keep those with us. Let's use those. Because often my patients I find get out of treatment and then like forget all the stuff that they used in treatment or the things that were helpful. And you might even be surprised. It might be like, oh, I guess that art therapy group uh, was really beneficial. Hmm. Maybe I should make time for some collaging and coloring as maybe childish or silly as it seems. Maybe I should make time for that because that's what feels good to me. So make that time and do that thing and write down the things that helped you before because that will prevent another, you know, relapse or us falling apart again. We need to have the support that we, you know, have put together and we need to have our coping skills at the ready to assist us as we work through this. And also don't forget that number one, the most important, do not set yourself up for failure by doing the exact same amount of work, credits, uh, internships, whatever that you were doing before. Okay, let's move on to question number two. And question number two says, can you possibly talk about the relationship between eating disorders and control? I guess I'm asking this in regard to the general sentiment that eating disorders are us, quote unquote, controlling what we can. I'm confused about this because of how how out of control it feels. Yes. I've been thinking about this as I've recently become aware that I've developed an eating disorder as some type of coping mechanism. I'm not sure why it showed up or how it's taken me years to realize what's going on. And although I know restricting is about gaining some type of control, I just can't quite connect the dots as to what makes that so. Considering deep down, especially now, that I can see what's truly been happening. So I desperately want to eat to take care of my body and to be healthy, yet I just cannot physically make myself do it half the time. Could it just be compounding depression or something? Does this make sense or am I off base in my understanding or interpretation of what an eating disorder is? I just can't seem to make lasting change no matter how hard I'm trying and I want and want to get better. I should add that I'm just starting therapy for the first time, thanks to you. Yay. And I've had one session and can already see the process unfolding. Maybe that's the final step to actually gaining my control back. Anyway, thank you so much, Katie. I hope you're doing okay. I am. Okay. A lot to unpack here. And there's also um, a couple of add-ons. So, People always say that eating disorders are about control and controlling what we can. And that's true for some of us, but it's not always so cut and dried. So bear with me. I'm going to give you some examples. So hopefully we can kind of see what people mean by this quote unquote, gaining a sense of control. Now I've had patients who were abused and were told by their abuser that they liked them because they were chubby, let's say. They liked the little squish or some made some comment that was super upsetting and essentially triggering. So they they restrict their food so that they aren't squishy and therefore maybe aren't attractive to that person. Okay, so that can be a reason. Another reason can be that you feel you have to earn everything, and this can come out of perfectionism, type A, or being told by your parents that like you aren't good enough in some one way or another. Maybe like they always were hard on you. Uh, they could be helicopter parents. They could be completely neglectful. And we think if I do everything just right, then they will pay attention to me. It can come from that. Um, I've also had patients who, when their parents get divorced or they have to move a lot, they control what they can, meaning their body. Now, this can mean that we exercise. This can mean that we restrict our food, that we overeat. It could be any number of things because there's nothing else we can actually control other than ourselves. Now, eating disorders, you could say, are about regaining a sense of control over self because everything else is swirling and twirling. But like I just shared a few examples, I think it's deeper than that. I think that's a piece of it. And for a lot of us, it is the only thing we can control. Like for you, I, I you know, I don't know exactly where it came out of. I'd have to know a little bit more about your history, but 
the restriction could mean something to you that isn't just controlling what we can. It could mean more about like, I haven't earned it. I'm not good enough. Or I'll prove to my mom or my dad or my whoever that I can do this, that I am strong enough, not necessarily lose weight, but that I'm strong enough to to do what I need to do, right? We can have a lot of these different thoughts or beliefs around our eating. And yes, for some people, it is purely a control thing, but for a lot of us, it's not. Now, yes, you could say, and I don't know if this is making sense, but hopefully it is. You could say that when we can't control other things, we control our bodies, but I don't always think that's a conscious thing in the thought that you're trying to like, we're controlling what we can, but I don't really feel like that's what I'm doing, right? It's not always that directly connected. It could be that we just feel like other things are swirling or that this is the one way we can get our needs met or that this is how we have to earn our food or we could have any kind of beliefs about it. The underlying current could be, well, this is the one thing that I can control, but I don't think it's it's so outwardly aware. We're not so outwardly aware of it. It's not so conscious. It could be more subconscious. I hope that makes sense. But I do believe that maybe for you, you're coping. I, I have to know what you're coping with, like, or coping from, or whatever you want to say. Like, what are we using this to cope? Like, what's the thing that's triggered this? This need for coping comes from where? And that will give us a little bit more information. But you're not completely off base. I think there, and depression could also affect it. But I think that for you, it's possible. Wanting to get better is a huge first step. And most of my patients don't really get there until they're in their recovery process, kind of being forced to, for lack of a better term, in a treatment facility. Most of my patients never want to get better, but the fact that you do is amazing and it's going to be incredibly motivating, but we're going to learn as we get into therapy, what purpose that eating disorder served. And we're going to realize that it is, there is another layer on top of just wanting to get better. There is going to be that layer of this has always worked to make me feel better. I'm angry that you're trying to take it away, or I'm scared that we're trying to get rid of it. There's going to be that other layer that's normal. It's okay. You will get through it. But yeah, you're not totally off base, but I think for other people, just to find, just to wrap this up, you're not totally off base. I think just it di- differs from person to person what the like top of mind issue is that has led us to our eating disorder. Okay. Now there's a comment on this says, as an add-on, could you talk about this specifically for bulimia or other binge related disorder, binging related disorders? I feel I mostly hear the world the, about the control narrative for anorexia. And I'm not sure what the popular notion is on why people develop binging and purging behaviors. Thanks for all that you do. Of course, binging and purging is more of an an impulse type of behavior. They're they're all a little bit impulsive, but my patients who binge and purge or just binging. So let's get into binging, purging, and binging. This is kind of interesting and just hang with me. But like my anorexic patients or more restrictive patients restrict in more ways than one and meaning they probably won't spend on themselves. They don't like the cost of food, so they won't buy it, right? They don't take vacations. They don't do a lot of things to give to themselves because there's this underlying belief that like, I'm not worth it. This is terrible. Um, No one's, I'm, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not good enough, all that. Now, my bulimic patients tend to be more impulsive around spending and eating. And there's, I don't know why there's this correlation between spending and eating, but there is. My bulimic patients will do this sort of like all or nothing, black and white, like, fuck it, I'm gonna binge, they binge. And then immediately there's remorse and they're like, I'm gonna purge and I'm gonna get rid of this. It's almost like the difference between, they're all very similar, like all eating disorders are very related, which is why we can toggle between the two. I find bulimia to have a swing between feeling really out of control and then trying to regain control. And this is usually not to say we can directly correlate it, but I find this a lot with more of my anxiously attached patients and anorexia more with my avoidant type of patients. Not always, it's not hundred percent, but I'm just giving you some ideas now. So there's still some control in there, letting go of control, regaining control, right? Now binging, we could think, well, you're not regaining control. You're not purging. Hmm. We binge as a way to soothe and that soothing that we feel, just like all eating disorder behaviors, it's soothing to our system in one way or another. We're soothed because we're hungry and that's all we can think about. We don't think about the thing that's really bothering us. In bulimia, 
The binging and purging serves this soothing purpose, right? It helps us act out of how we feel and then regain that control and feel composed again. Binging allows for us to feel so full, that's all we can think about, and we feel soothed by that. And so all of it, I think instead of talking about control, I would talk more about the, the soothing abilities from it. And I think that that's kind of where it comes from when it comes to bulimia or binging related disorders as a whole, is this kind of soothing from feeling full or soothing from like doing something like punishing ourselves and getting back into control and feeling like we're back into that soothing place. The control narrative applies to all eating disorders, but again, it's not so clear. It's more about self-soothing. It's a coping skill. I think we kind of have to step away from just talking about it with control being the main driver. Control's there, but I honestly think soothing is in the front seat and control is in the back seat, along with like punishment and um, worthiness, shame, guilt. Those are all in the car with you, but I think the, the driver is soothing because we're doing what we can with what we have to feel better. And to other people on the outside, they don't understand that. They might not realize that, oh, this makes me feel like I've earned it. I'm worthy. This makes me feel calm. Um, This stops me from thinking about the painful thing that happened to me, right? There can be a lot tied up in an eating disorder. It's not just control. So when people tell you, oh, yeah, it's about controlling. They're trying to take control back. Mm, Maybe. But I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to self-soothe and feel better. And we just don't have another way of doing it. Okay. There's another add-on. It says, I'm wondering about the same as my eating disorder has shifted quite a few times, all three major eating disorders. And I'm also struggling with agoraphobia and OCD. I feel like they all have the same thing in common, a need for safety. Here we go. And try to get it through. And I try to get it through control. How can I feel safe in my world and body and just in general? See, there it is. Yes, we do it through control. Like it's in the car. But the driver's safety, the driver's self-soothing, the driver is feeling okay. That's always what we're trying to do with coping skills. That's the reason we use them. They work. They make us feel better, right? But then they often have really rough side effects that we're like, oh, now it's not making me feel better, right? Now our eating disorder is getting in the way. I've lost a bunch of weight and I have to be in the hospital, tube fed. I've gained a bunch of weight and I am struggling with other health issues. I am binging and purging and I've learned that my electrolytes are low, and now I have a, a r- irregular heartbeat, right? And I'm, those are just examples. There's all sorts of things that can happen. But it's more about safety. It's more about soothing. It's more about feeling okay. That's why it's called a coping skill. No one said control is coping. Control can get us there. Like, like this person said, I'm trying to get it through control. So how do we feel safe in the world, body, and just in general? We're going to have to find ways to soothe our nervous system down, other coping skills. I know this is a shitty answer, but it's the truth. A lot of times repetitive behaviors like vacuuming, uh, folding clothes, do, putting the dishes away, walking, coloring, all of those things are very repetitive motions that we're doing. And those things can be very soothing and put us into like a neutral space. I think the goal is more neutral rather than safe because safe in and of itself can be triggering. And so find a way to feel neutral. And I think there's some somatic experiencing work that could be helpful for you, some grounding techniques to get you back into your body, meaning taking all your five senses and noticing what you smell, noticing what you feel on your skin. Do you feel the chair under your butt? Do you, what do you um, taste if you have, you know, coffee or water? Is there anything that you taste? Bringing you back in, maybe even touching different parts of your body on your shoulder, on your arms. Can you feel that touch? What's that feel like? It feels warm. I feel the pressure. Can we squeeze? How's that feel? Can we take some deep breaths? Get back into ourselves. It's going to take time and you're going to want to jump right back out, but work with your therapist. Doing these tasks and finding some ways to soothe are going to be really helpful. We're going to have to replace that eating disorder behavior with other tools. And since you said agoraphobia and OCD, which are both anxiety related, you know, medication could be helpful there too. An SSRI or SNRI could get us back on track and help take the edge off so that we're able to participate more fully in therapy and try new things and put ourselves out there and, you know, push against that agoraphobia and OCD urges. Okay. Another person said more specifically, does control have to be related to physical appearance? No, not at all. My eating disorder took hold 
at a time when I was emotionally dysregulated often and stuck in what I now know was a trauma response coming out of an extremely painful medical situation. I'm so sorry. Eventually, when I saw my body changing, I definitely struggled with body image and a desire to lose weight. But it didn't start that way. And my body was never my main motivation. Overall, I didn't use my eating disorder to control my physical appearance, but rather to control my emotions. See, again, control's in the car, but it's not the driver. We want to feel better. We want to feel soothed. We want to feel safe. We want to feel okay. If I was starving, I was distracted, and both the physical and mental symptoms of the trauma decreased. Exactly. I could and, st and still can focus 10 times better when I'm hungry than when I'm full. The gnawing at my stomach became a comfort and the feeling of fullness became associated with anxiety. Mm -hmm. My eating disorder urges aren't the strongest when I see my weight or reflection, but they are the strongest when I'm scared, angry, or threatened. Does control with eating disorders always have to be related to physical appearance or is my experience common? How does trauma fit into the picture? Exactly as you said it. So no eating disorders aren't about how we look. It's a distraction. The whole thing is a distraction. That's the coping mechanism, right? That's why it's a coping skill. It helps us self-soothe. It gives us something else to focus on. That's why I think this control narrative has gotten out of control, dare we say, because people say you control what you can, right? Which is true. We use this, but we use the, our body and we control our body. But the reason that we do it is not for that sense of control. It's for the distraction. We don't want to think about something else. We don't want to focus on that something else that is going on, that belief that we have about ourselves. So we focus on food. Like you said, being hungry keeps you, you feel like you're more productive and you don't have to think about the trauma. That's your coping skill. Everybody's different. Some people feel soothed by being full. Some people feel soothed by being, um, you know, hungry. And some of us swing back and forth because it's really not about the food or the hunger fullness, it's actually about what else is going on and what we're trying to distract ourselves from. And I've had tons of patients where one eating disorder will work for a while and then it stops and we swing to another. Or we'll go into treatment, we're not able to do some of our behaviors, we try another. Because again, it's not about the fucking food. It's not about how we look. It's not about any of that. It's about how we need to soothe ourselves so we feel better, right? Controlling the emotions. You needed to soothe those. They felt uncomfortable, what are we going to do about that? We're going to focus on something else. So eating disorders aren't related to physical appearance all the time. For some people, yes, but I find the majority is actually no. Your experience is incredibly common. And trauma fits into the picture because that's the thing that we're distracting ourselves from. That's why we need, we need this coping skill is because of that trauma. So you'll probably find that as you process through that trauma, the urge to use your eating disorder will lessen. Okay. Okay, let's move on to question number three. This question says, Katie, can you talk about the difference between ADHD, autism, and complex PTSD in how they might present specifically in females? I'm trying to discern which issue I might be facing. Of course, needing a mental health professional to do an assessment. Yes, it's like you read my mind. I have had intense trauma in the past, and I'm just not sure which might it might be it. I've always been weird compared to my siblings, but I'm not sure where potential symptoms of ASD stop and those of complex PTSD might start. Okay. So when it comes to females, I'm going to, instead of talking about each diagnosis, I'm just going to talk about the ways that they're different. Okay. Now, ADHD comes along with what's known as executive dysfunction, as well as potentially, you know, if we have the hyperactivity component, it can be really hard for us to sit still. It can be hard for us to focus on things for a long period of time. That's kind of the attention. So there's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's what ADHD stands for. Some of us have the like more physically agitated part of it. And some of us have more of the internally agitated part. Okay. Meaning that we could struggle to sit still. We could be really restless, fidgety, or we can be really restless internally. Meaning we could have kind of more of a difficulty concentrating. We can get really agitated. We can forget things and um, struggle to like follow through with what we know we need to do. And so, but then if someone tries to help us, we can feel really irritated by it because we're like, ah, oh, I know how, right? And so ADHD has more to do with a low level of dopamine, a low level of dopamine transponders. So we go out in the world looking for things that are new and novel that have like, we have like a short time frame to work on so we can focus. You know, it's a challenge 
there can be a lot of, I always forget all the five reasons, the five ways we can focus with ADHD. But needless to say, the struggle is in focus and execution, okay? And just hold that in your brain. Obviously, I have tons of videos about ADHD and I'm working on one right now, but just hold that in your brain that it's more about like attention, I guess also being calm, like being able to sit still, like, because I don't know if you have the hyperactivity and execution of what needs to happen in life, right? Okay. So that's ADHD in a nutshell. There's also other things like it can be a little impulsive, stuff like that. But let's, for the sake of this argument, let's talk about that. When it comes to autism, the difficulties we have with autism are more socially related, meaning that autistic people function just fine doing what they love to do. Uh, we can still have what the one overlap I see a lot between ADHD and autism is the hyper focus. We can find something that we're really interested in and like completely hone in on it and know everything about it and work on it really intensely. That's the overlap. But the differences are that autism has to do a lot, especially with females, but males too, is that in social situations, we find ourselves mimicking or mirroring what other people are doing because we don't actually know how to do that naturally. It's not innate. When other kids and people learn to like, oh, hi, and you smile and you show this, to, like the 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 pure facial expression, um, social interaction, like the normalcies in our social society, we don't get it. It like doesn't make sense to us. It's not necessary. Okay. And so we can come across sometimes kind of flat or having a reaction that people don't understand. They're like, that's not what, like, why are you making a joke? This is a funeral <clears throat> or something like that. Autism can come along with the difficulties there. Also, speech can be, depending on where we lie on the spectrum, we can be hyperverbal, like talk really quickly, really fast about all the things that we're interested in or struggle to communicate at all. And we cannot feel like we can connect with people. So that's more of the autism as well as feeling sensory overload very quickly. Now that can also come along with ADHD. So there's a little overlap there too, okay? And that's why those can be misdiagnosed and why we need to be properly assessed. Okay, autism has more to do socially than ADHD, okay? Like being kind of socially awkward and it being difficult for us to feel connected, which can lead to depression and stuff like that, but okay. So that's that. Now let's move into complex PTSD. Complex PTSD comes with definite dysregulation, which you could see could overlap with these, but we have to have a trauma in our past, which ADHD and autism don't have, repeated traumas, okay? And that makes it difficult for us to keep relationships. We can feel hypervigilant a lot. I feel like the main difference here is that the symptoms of ADHD and autism don't have anything to do with fear. We experience the symptoms of ADHD and autism regardless of what's happening in our environment. Whereas those of us with complex PTSD, a lot of it's related to environment because number one, something harmed us in our environment more than once. Number two, because of that, anything that reminds us of the trauma puts us on edge. Therefore, it's hard for us to have relationships and relate to people because we don't feel safe in our world. And because of the trauma, we can be really reactive, which then you can see the overlap with autism or ADHD, where we can be like irritated, overstimulate. If there's too much noise and stuff like that, we can get overwhelmed. I think that's kind of like the overarching like similarities here are the tendency for overwhelm and um, the difficulty with connection with other people. Although I would argue ADHD probably doesn't have as much of that, but you can see the differences hopefully and how kind of each piece could fit with some symptoms, but the but by and large, the majority of each of three of these diagnoses are very different, right? ADHD is more like concentration, being able to sit still, um, executive function, like execution of the things we need to do in an orderly fashion, memory. Autism has more to do with social interactions and our ability to regulate, like too much stimulation can send us through the roof. And obviously I'm, these are very summarized. I have videos on all these things. Complex PTSD is more to do with what has happened to us and our reaction to that and us feeling on edge as a result and that affecting our ability to stay present, concentrate, focus in conversation, right? It's kind of more about the cause behind these things and the pre main presenting symptoms. But as you can see, there are like some symptoms that overlap, okay? 
So get assessed. And hopefully that kind of helps you tease out where things are coming from. Since ADHD and autism are not caused by trauma, I don't believe working on the trauma first is going to alleviate some of those things. But whatever symptoms you find to be the most distressing would be the ones I'd work on first. Okay. Now there's a comment on this that my question is also about differential diagnosis. That's what we call it when we try to figure out which one we're struggling with. I was treated for social anxiety. The diagnosis was right. However, I'm not sure if I might have agoraphobia too. You possibly could. I still don't go outside the house much. And whenever I and whenever I had a panic attack, my fear was not being able to escape. Hmm, it does sound like agoraphobia. And not seasonal affective disorder related, like on a plane, in a club, or on the dance floor. I also fear going into stores I haven't been to with someone before. On my drive to and from work, I cannot take a detour, for example, to go to the store. Only if I've practiced practiced with someone before. It definitely could be agoraphobia. For those of you who don't know, agoraphobia is is an anxiety disorder and we struggle. It's not always, it it usually ends up leaving us stuck at our home, but it can also mean that we fear going to a new place or a place in general where getting out of that place we fear could be embarrassing or we could cause a panic attack, right? We're always worried that we're just going to be overwhelmed in that place and not be able to get out of there and it would be embarrassing to us. And so the fear is so intense that we prefer to stay in our safe spaces. A lot of times it's just our house, but for a lot of my patients, it's been like home and work, right? Okay. And that's why going to the store, if you haven't been there before, is too overwhelming because you're afraid of what might happen. Hence why it's an anxiety disorder, right? We have that uncontrollable worry that something could happen and we could be embarrassed and it could be really bad. And so it gets to the point, it can get our world can get so small that we struggle to leave our home. I have a lot of patients with agoraphobia who were so grateful that COVID happened because they got to stay home, didn't have to engage with anybody. So yes, I would ask, I would ask your therapist, I would get assessed because it does sound like that to me too, that that's a possibility. Okay, let's move on to question number four. This question says, hi, Katie, I work in the mental health field. And it says, and action all the incoming referrals. I wonder if they just mean and have to take in, you know, have to deal with all the incoming referrals. However, I often find them very triggering. I have stable, bipolar, and have self-harmed for a long time. Anything that mentions self-harm really triggers my urges. I feel like such a fraud working in mental mental health and still self-harming. I've even cut and worked bathrooms. I have a therapist and I'm currently only seeing her once a month. We should increase that if you can. Any advice on managing this would be great. Thank you. Increase your sessions. Impulse logs. And I, if you can find a DBT-based therapist, I don't know if your therapist is, but dialectical behavior therapy, I know that people say it's for BPD and not everyone who self-injures has BPD, by the way. But what it does help us with is emotion regulation. And mindfulness is a huge piece too. But us being more aware of our emotional state as it builds and being able to to take a beat and regulate or have tools and skills that we can use to like, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to back burner. I'm going to, you know, journal this out and leave it. I'm going to play this out. I'm going to do, there's a ton of different tools and resources within CBT and DBT, but DBT specifically not only gives us tools to better ta- like check in with ourselves, but also what to do when we feel ourselves building to that a p- potential like impulsive action, in this case, self-injuring. And so you might look into that because I think that could be incredibly beneficial. And if your therapist is willing, you could even grab one of the DBT workbooks. Um, I link the ones that I love in my Amazon shop. So you can go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Morton. There are two in there. One, the green one, I think McKay is the author of one of them. That one would be best because it kind of explains things pretty simply and then has some resources and worksheets. The other, there's another one that's just purely worksheets. And that's helpful too, but you know, the other one's a little has is a little more in depth. So if you had to pick between, I'd pick that one. Now, impulse logs, I have one in my my book traumatized. I talk about impulse logs is also, I know it's not the best video explanation. It's not the best thing, but if you go to, I think it's selfinjury.org, you can look up their self, their impulse log. It's a great resource too, because it essentially walks us through the urge that we have to harm ourselves, pushes us to 
identify what it is we're experiencing and what we're trying to express through it. And I feel like it really gives us not only a greater understanding of our self-injury urges, but also a greater understanding of self. And it prevents us from acting out on an impulse and gives us a beat to consider if we want to do that thing or not. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I always have my patients. This is the, I, I put, put together a safety plan with them, which you might want to encourage your therapist to do with you. I have them list three coping skills. So one would be an impulse log. Another could be calling a friend, uh, going for a walk, petting a dog, journaling, any number of things. I want at least one to be a process-based coping skill, but I have my video 25 coping skills. You can look that up and find one that works for you. But three three things, try those, wait 30 minutes, and then I give them permission to self-injure if they still want to. But I find the self-injury urges go up, hang around for maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30, maybe longer. Everybody's different, but they don't last that long and they go down. And if we can hang in there, if we can do something else while that urge peaks, we'll be okay and we'll get through and we'll realize the beautiful thing is when we do that, then we realize it goes away. I don't have to self-injure to make this go away. It's like this huge light bulb moment for a lot of my patients are like, holy shit. If I just waited, it wouldn't be so bad. So give that a try. Those are just some of my tips and tools and ways to manage. Being in the mental health field, there's going to be things that are always kind of triggering we're human too, right? We have our own struggles, things that we're working on. The fact that you have to do the incoming referrals kind of sucks. Doing intakes can be rough. I had to do those for a long time and you just never know what you're going to get. It's different when you're like a therapist or working at a clinic on a specific issue. The likelihood of you running into something that you don't want to is a little bit lower, but we can't control our outside space. We only can control ourselves. And that's why putting together a safety plan and utilizing impulse logs and things like that could really, really help. Okay. You got this. You're not a fraud. Everybody struggles. I always like to say that as long as we're managing our mental health issues and we're working on ourselves, it actually makes us better at our job. Because if you saw someone come into the hospital who was self-injuring, you're not going to be like one of those ignorant, you know, clinicians at a hospital who tells them, you know, you know, you're wasting time and like people really are hurt here and they assume it's a suicide attempt or they assume a lot of things about it you're not going to be that person. You're not going to judge them. They're going to feel seen and heard. And that's like beautiful people. You know, it's almost like you could be helping younger you in a way. I think that's great. Now there's a comment on this as I kind of relate to this. I'm a psych nurse and I also struggle with generalized anxiety disorder, MDD and self-injury. And I feel like such a fake often offering encouragement and hope to my patients when it's hard to give it to myself. I am in therapy, taking meds and have been in a residential facility. Any tips on how to navigate this? I think continuing to take care of yourself. And and like I said, it's reframing it. Sometimes we can't offer the things to ourselves that we offer to someone else. Let's be curious about that. Not judgmental. You're doing the best you can. And I'm glad that you're there for them. Again, having experienced things ourselves gives us a greater layer or level of understanding. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's in recovery. And he's, I think he's been recovered for three years now. And I, as a non-alcoholic, non-addict you know, addict in recovery, I can't understand his experience. I don't really get it. And like I've talked before, it took me forever until I was listening to that podcast by Dax Shepard about his addiction. I was like, oh my God, it's not a choice. Oh my God. Now I'm a therapist and I knew that logically, but emotionally it didn't sink in. So just know that while we can look at our mental illnesses and our mental health struggles and our past experiences and be embarrassed and think, oh, we should have it all together. In order to help someone else, we should have it all together. That's not the truth. That experience, good, bad, ugly, whatever, gives us a depth of understanding and empathy for our patients and makes us better as long as we take care of our shit and don't bring it into their sessions or into our appointments with them. Okay. It allows us like to ask questions that someone else might not ask. I'll never forget, this isn't even related to me specifically, but I worked up, I have a, I've had a bunch of schizophrenic patients in my practice and when I worked in the hospital. I know that's surprising to people, but p- schizophrenic people can operate perfectly fine in their life if they are treated, you know, quickly and with medication that doesn't sedate them too much. And I was meeting with another clinician and we were talking about, he runs a group with schizophrenic patients. And I said, oh, how many of them are trying to date each other? And that level of understanding between us about what I'd seen, my experience in the past, he was like, oh my God, how did you know? He's like, I always tell them like, 
let's not do that. It could affect the group. He's like, and always. And I said, because there's a, there's a level of understanding between them. They feel connected. They feel like they get each other. And that's that's what we're looking for is connection. And I only bring up that example to express that like, you think it's a detriment, but it's not. It's a connection. It's a piece that could be really helpful and healing for someone else. And so I think it makes you better at your job. I know you're like, Katie, schizophrenics and groups, not the same. I know it's not the same, but it's just a, a, a short analogy to show you just how powerful a connection is when there's shared experience. Now, I'm not saying you tell your patients, oh, I struggle with this and blah, 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 but it can encourage you to ask a question that someone else might not consider because you know that that's how it applies and how it you felt it felt for you, you know? And so take care of yourself. Keep doing what you're doing to manage your own. Maybe that means creating a safety plan or something like that, but know that it's going to make you better at your job. And by knowing what questions to ask and checking in with them in a way that someone else might not, that you can be the clinician that maybe you had needed earlier on. Okay. Now let's move on to question number five. This says, can we talk about the issues? Oh, can we talk about issues with self-compassion? I am currently in a PHP. PHP stands for partial hospitalization program. I'm currently in a PHP program and have been working on self-compassion, but I am struggling so much. I cannot help it, but so I cannot help but so totally hate myself. I know it comes from having low self-esteem, but it also has been reinforced through trauma and emotional abuse. I also know that it doesn't help having marital issues as well, especially since I usually personalize like everything from him. Anyway, in PHP, I'm super triggered by the assignments and it hits my depression. And it, I just, it's just been making everything else worse, self-harm and um, suicidal ideation. I just realized the person before that said SI might have meant suicidal ideation, not uh, self-injury because I was just talking about self-injury. So sorry about that. I've been using my new skills to try to calm myself, but it only helps for so long and the feelings come back. Any thoughts or tips would be awesome. Thanks, Katie. I think you're going to hate this, but this is the answer. When it comes to self-compassion, first of all, let your therapist and your team at the PHP program know that this is happening. It also sounds like PHP might be a little overwhelming and maybe a little bit too much too fast. So let them know that you're feeling that way. Okay. Now, having taken care of that, we have to notice our self-talk. We're going to have to start journaling. And I don't mean journaling like everything that you did that day. You don't have to do that. But I want you to pay attention to what you say to yourself and I want you to jot it down. And then I want you to bridge statement it. I want you to imagine me helping you along. What would a bridge statement look like? Maybe, possibly, I'm open to the thought that it could be not as bad or I could maybe not be such a piece of shit. Whatever it is you say to yourself, I want you to argue a little bit back. Not positive, but again, not negative, right? So I want you to start pushing back on that little at a time with those bridge statements. I know it sucks. I know it's hard, but please let them know, you know, that the assignments are super triggering. They need to know that because we, it sounds like you need more coping skills, but I know your main question is about self-compassion, but um, doing that, the tracking of your thoughts and the things you tell yourself and arguing back will overall improve how you feel about yourself and your situation. But we need to let the PHP people know that you're super triggered by the assignments and it makes everything worse because that's not the goal of PHP. The goal is to help you feel more supported, get you to a place where you can work through the things that you couldn't do on your own. You felt like you kept hitting a wall. Um, yeah, but let, I know that's not fully the question, but yeah, that those are my thoughts is that we need to let them know this is happening so they can slow it down or help you process it through, or give you different homework. Or maybe this means that you need more, uh, you know, more frequent therapy, more support in other ways. The fact that you're feeling so triggered is a little, I worry about it. I don't want you feeling that dysregulated, but in back to this, the actual question about self-compassion, let's challenge those thoughts because you're having them all day, every day, and they're living rent-free and they're making you feel worse. So let's bridge statement it. You got it. Okay, now a comment says, I can relate. I've been attempting your ideas of using bridge statements for over six months now while trying to gain self-compassion, but it just doesn't work. Whatever I say to myself, my mind just won't believe it. Maybe we're starting too far off. Maybe instead of the bridge statements being things that maybe that's too positive. Maybe if the thought is I'm such a worthless piece of shit, my bridge statement is um, maybe I'm, you know, three quarters of a worthless piece of shit. Maybe I'm like a quarter of me might be kind of worthwhile. I'm open to the thought that maybe I am. 
I know, again, these sound terrible. They sound not positive at all. That's not the goal. The goal is not for them to be positive. The goal is for them to be just slightly less negative. So you could even, a bridge statement might even be, you know, I'm open to believing that that Katie could be maybe 10% correct that mm, I should challenge these thoughts. Again, that's not even positive. Should challenge these thoughts. That's not even, but it's, it's different. It's not as negative. It's not as blaming. It's not as shaming, right? So see if that kind of works. Because sometimes when people tell me they don't work, I'm like, ooh, I think you might be moving too far too fast. And that's probably my, my fault because maybe the ones I offered up are just too far forward for you. Also, as a add-on, Sometimes my patients, when their depression is really, really heavy, which may mean we need a different medication, medication in general, or a higher dose, talk to your psychiatrist about that. But it could mean that the depression is too much that we can't see out of it. And so anything we say, we're not going to believe it. And so I wonder if maybe that's what's happening too. So it's not so much that you're not trying to do the work, it's that you're drowning in the symptoms so the work isn't working. Since I've also been trying to check the facts when I shit talk myself, but I tend to come up with reasons why the shit talk is true. How can I get past this roadblock in my head? Thanks so much. Let's stop checking the facts if that's not working. Because if we can't come up with other facts, the thing is, is um, when we're really depressed, we think our thoughts are our facts. And it's really hard to prove otherwise. So let's pause on that. Let's work on the bridge statements being less bridgy, like just par- like just a little bit less negative. Also, if you feel comfortable, you could ask someone in your life, like a best friend, a partner, even a therapist about some good things about you, have them write them down and give them to you or at least even email it or text it so you have access to it so you can read it. I know you're not going to believe it, but that can help a little bit too. You can have your therapist help you check the facts. But again, that belief, I believe, I think that the med- that our depression or whatever is going on is, is dr- helping us or keeping us drowning in the symptoms and we need to get our head above water. And so I believe that maybe medication could be the way to kind of pull us out because we're just, it's just too heavy. We can't do any of the work, you know, and that's okay. Nothing's wrong with you. Sometimes we just need, well, honestly, all research proves medication with therapy gives us the best outcome. So, okay. Now, somebody else commented that that could have been a page from my journal. I'm supposed to be practicing this. I'm supposed to be having compassion and love for my inner child. I am not a fan of her. When I'm honest, I hate everything about her. I also get so angry just thinking about her. How do I get through the inner child therapy? How can I know that younger me, what younger me would even need or think about? In my inner child workshop, which if if you're looking for help with this, I encourage you to check it out on my website, katiemorton.com. I talk about this a lot. The fact that it's okay to be angry and send, not send, but write some nasty ass letters to our inner child. It's okay to be mad. Then let her talk back and be mad at you have a fight with yourself. It's that internalized shame, blame, and guilt that comes from trauma that holds us frozen in this shitty place where we shit talk ourselves, we shit talk our life, and we hate who we are. That's essentially what's happening. You're hating who you are. You're so angry. Allow for that. It's okay to be angry. Pretending it's not there is what's making it worse. Have some nasty letters between you and your inner child. I know you're like, Katie, that sounds not healthy. We shouldn't keep doing it over and over for years, but we should feel free to do it like, you know, for a little while so we can at least express what we're feeling and what we're experiencing. And through those angry letters, I won't, I'd be surprised if you don't learn something about your inner child and what, what he or she was needing or thinking about. Maybe pull out a picture of your younger self too when you argue back that it's you at that age. What would you tell an adult talking to you that way? Like, fuck you, you have no idea what I'm going through. I can't get out of this house, this sucks, right? What would you say? Maybe you wouldn't cuss because you're a kid, right? I don't know. My mom would have not let me do that. That could be a way in. It's okay to be angry at our inner child. And sometimes we have to throw tantrums. That's our inner child speaking through us. I have a feeling your inner child is very, very angry. And that's where this is coming from. But you let me know. Okay, now the final add-on says, I also feel resentment towards my inner child. I wish she would stop interfering in my current life so I could be less reactive. I've learned to identify her presence and can understand where her reactions are coming from, but I still get angry with her and with myself for letting her run the show. And I just added that in, even though there's not really a question because it kind of pertains to the other one. Let's write some angry letters. Let's throw a tantrum. Let's yell at ourselves. We have to get that out. 
Otherwise, that shame, blame, and guilt just is internalized and it feels even worse. Okay, final question number six says, hey, Katie, I hope you're well. Is it unhealthy to switch languages in my head to cope? I've heard from a lot of you this is incredibly common. Let's get into it. It says, I'm not sure that my question is relatable or makes any sense, but I do the switch quite often and would love to know your stance. For a bit of context, I am bilingual and I live, I've lived most of my life in my second language, English. For the past six months, I've been switching from English to my native language when spiraling to stop it from happening. I do the same thing the other way around, mostly when thinking about hard things that's happened prior to me moving to the U.S. three years ago. Any overwhelm that I felt will lead me to switching from one language to another, usually to rationalize. And I use this quote unquote technique to create distance within myself. That's what I would have assumed, AKA not feel the feelings. Mm -hmm. While it helps keep my emotions under control most times, it doesn't seem like a great way to cope. Is this something you've heard before? Could this be considered dissociation? It feels kind of similar to when I dissociation, but or when I dissociate, but also different. When I make the switch, I have a hard time engaging in conversations and other social activities as I feel stuck in the other language. I feel like this is an odd thing to do, but I also don't want to create false problems for myself as I already deal with PTSD, depression, anxiety, and trichotillomania. And P.S. I've considered bringing it up in therapy, but I'm afraid I'll sound a bit crazy. You won't. But we'll talk about that. The urge to switch comes up in therapy too. Thank you so much for all that you do. Okay, so great question. I've heard from a lot of people that they'll switch languages in therapy in general because of these reasons, or I've also heard just if you're out there and thinking that you're weird, you're not that some languages have better ways of describing things and it feels more real to do it in a certain language. Um, I've heard from a lot of people that English tends to have, I don't know why, more probably because we're more upset, I don't know, more ways to communicate certain upsets. And so it feels more uh, more real or more tangible, like it's, it's, it's actually what we're feeling, right? We can really put our finger on it. But I think it's a distance thing, just like you suspect. When I was reading this earlier, when I was gathering your questions, I thought immediately, I was like, oh, this is to separate. It's like you have two parts of yourself. I think there are, if you're, and maybe I'm just hypothesizing with you. I wonder if you have like English speaking you and native tongue you, and you think that they're different, not really think, not believe, but feel like they're different. And one can handle some things and another can handle another thing. And that's why I think it feels kind of like dissociation a little bit, because if you guys don't know, like dissociative identity disorder is kind of like an in more intensive version where we have a bunch of different alters or different versions of ourselves and we toggle between to try to cope. And I think you're kind of toggling between these two versions of yourself as a way of coping. And so I might encourage you to be curious about this and see what they like, what is English speaking? You Like, how are they different? Let's be curious about this. What do you, what is it you think that one can handle and the other can't and why or why not? And I'd let your therapist know this isn't crazy or weird. This is incredibly common. It's just our way of separating ourselves out. It's like the inner child and us as an adult. There's just no different. It's almost like younger you versus adult you maybe. I don't know. But anyway, I think there is something in there that's a, a little, a little distance, a little dissociation, a little separation. Because it's not actually dissociation. You're not like oh, removing from self. You're jumping from self to self. And I think probably your PTSD is the main trigger, but anxiety can trigger it as well. And also anxiety, you know, trichotillomania is an anxiety disorder. It's driven by anxiety. Um, and depression, if it gets too intense, we might struggle. Like one, we might think one part of ourselves can handle it and the other can't. I know it sounds silly because it, it's like just language, but you have a belief about yourself when you speak one language versus the other. Like you're a different person, maybe. I don't know. I'd be curious about that. Okay. And keep me posted. Now, there was a comment on this that says, regarding coping, should we suppress dysfunctional thoughts, for example, brought up by triggers, or will that lead to depression, depression-like suppressed emotions? Suppressing anything like dysfunctional thoughts is not helpful. It does not mean we have to engage in them. Thoughts are just thoughts, but we should acknowledge them. Maybe that means we journal about what's coming up for us if it doesn't cause us to ruminate but it's good to acknowledge them and allow them to pass. Thoughts are just thoughts. They come and go. We have new ones every few seconds. The, if we suppress anything, it will only come back to bite us later because we're not moving through it. We're holding it hostage inside ourselves and that's not gonna make any of us feel good, okay? Okay, thank you so much for listening and watching. I hope you found these answers helpful. Thank you for sending in your questions. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Do your homework and I'll see you next time.